Thank you so much for the warm welcome. I'm very happy to be here, very proud to be here, very proud that something I created 25 years ago is still of interest to young developers like yourself. The introduction mentioned that uh, I have a background from M MIT, and this, this picture was actually taken in 1991, the year the web was invented. And you can see a younger version of myself there, and to the left, a screen that I was working on. In 1991, this was quite an incredible device. It was a 2K by 2K screen, uh, unusual resolution, huge thing. I was probably the only person on the planet who had a screen wider than my shoulders. And uh, we used this to, to research electronic newspapers, how they could be published. And the web would have been perfect for that thing. But the web wasn't invented there in 1991. MIT had all the toys, all the brain powers, all the network connection to make it happen, but it didn't happen there. And that's a little bit of a, a sign that things don't always happen where they're planned or where they're supposed to happen. Instead, the web was invented in Europe, in a you know, slightly remote physics laboratory called CERN. It's um, in Geneva, outside of Geneva, on the border with France. And they're supposed, they're not to do computer stuff, really. They're supposed to find particles. It's an incredible, important work, looking at how the universe is put together by seeing what's inside the atoms. Um, but out of those experiments, this is, by the way, this is the world's biggest machine. Uh, it's an incredible thing beneath the ground. And you can see the scale of it by looking at this man standing at the bottom here. So this is a detector. And what they do is that they take these particles, they crash them, and in the detectors they see what comes out of that crash. Uh, and from those detectors, there's an awful lot of data coming. So, so CERN has a big computer department. And one of the guys who worked there is Tim Berners-Lee. This is a younger version of him, too. Um, I was not there when it happened. I was kind of in the, the wrong place. But I heard the Big Bang, and I came running. So in 1994, I joined his team there. And one of the things we did when I arrived was to set up this public web terminal. Um, I, I'm not a physicist, I don't know what goes through those pipes on the left, but I know a little bit about the computer on the right there. This was at a time when students didn't have their own computers, not all of them. So we set up this public web terminal to, to make it possible for people to try this web thing. And you can see on the board next to it, we tried to explain what people could do there. Um, we had uh, some, some information about the World Wide Web. We, you can see an early logo. Uh, on this one, and you can see the marketing campaign here. Uh, World Wide Web, you click, we do the rest. And I think, I think we can conclude here and now that it wasn't really the marketing slogan that made the World Wide Web succeed. Um, you click, we do the rest. We could probably have done better, but we were so busy doing the technical stuff, doing the foundations of the, the web. And Tim, he had invented three things that we, we all still use today, every day. He had invented the HTML language, he had invented the HTTP protocol, and also he had invented the concept of URLs. And those three things are still fundamental. And using those three things, you could create something truly incredible. And this is a screenshot from Mosaic, one of the first web browsers. Any Mosaic users? Anyone who has used? Yeah, there are some. That's good. That's great. <laughs> a long time ago. But it was an incredible experience when you could start Mosaic, you could get a document up, and you could see that blue text with underlined then you knew that this was a link, and you could click that link, and you could be taken somewhere else to another computer, another part of the world, another document. That was just wow, wow. So this thing attracted attention from a lot of people. And what they came to was the HTML language. In order to make one of those documents, you had to write HTML yourself, or like most people, they, they just copied someone else's document. Um, and here's. Here's what they would see. Starting point would typically be the H1 element, which is a headline element. Um, and uh, 
it has the starting tag and it has the end tag. And it, you can explain this to a person in about three minutes that the end tag has a slash on it, and what comes between the start tag and the end tag is the headline itself. It's very simple. You can learn HTML in 15 minutes if you know what a text editor is. And um, the simplicity of HTML, I think, is crucial to the success of the web. Also, the fact that it has um, uh, universal semantics. Everyone knows what a headline is. You don't need, need to be a doctor or a physicist in order to write HTML. Anyone can do it. And it's also an open standard. CERN didn't patent this thing. Tim didn't patent it. It let it out to everyone for you to use for free, which, which is one of the reasons why I think the web you know, is not owned by anyone. We should be really thankful. It could have been very different. We could have had a world that was owned by the telecoms or the big software companies. Instead, we have a web which is not owned by anyone, which I think is a very good thing. So even though you may struggle with some, some code, I know you're developers, um, if you struggle with some code, you know, late night hacking with CSS or HTML, you know, I tell you, it could have been worse. So, Making those HTML documents, you could do some incredible things, but the documents tend to be a little bland, and you can see today they appear, they're not so festive. And when designers came to the web, they wanted to have their favorite fonts, and they wanted the colors, they wanted the typography, they, they knew all this from PageMaker and other desktop publishing programs. So, they came to an HTML world where, no, you can't have that. You can only say this is a headline. You can't say anything about what font should be used for the headline. And, and what they said, well, well, that's too bad. Maybe I shouldn't use H1 then. Maybe I should make an image instead. Maybe I should just you know, put a GIF file in my document so that I can decide exactly what colors and fonts to use. And that's what they started doing. Um, and that was really a threat, because when people start to replace text with images, then we have trouble. Then uh, we can no longer search the documents. Uh, search engines would have been hard. Um, it's hard for blind people. You can't have a speech synthesizer read the document. And it takes more capacity to transfer. It would have turned the web into a giant fax machine. Remember fax machines? Yeah? You know, one user here in the front. <laughs> This thing is falling off. OK. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK. Good. Uh, so we, I, when I came to, to, to CERN, I said, you know, we need something here. We need a little language. We need something to give the designers what they would like to have. Uh, something to express typography, aesthetics, uh, something to say something about, you know, how beautiful things are. Because things are really beautiful out there. This picture is taken just outside of CERN. They have the Alps, like you have in Austria. Uh, this is Mont Blanc. Uh, I think it's even taller than uh, the Alps around here. And it's incredibly beautiful. And this is what our human perceptions like to see. Our human perception is tuned to visual aesthetics. And the world that sci the scientists at CERN create, where they organize information, that doesn't look so pretty. And what CSS tries to do is to combine these worlds where you have the organized documents, but you also have the sense of aesthetics, typography, hundreds of years of traditions of how to present information. So I came up with this idea of, of a little language where you said things like font size, and you said color, and it was just as simple as HTML, uh, but it said something different than HTML. It, it didn't say anything about the structure of the document. Instead, it said something about the presentation of the document. And it's also uh, an open standard, just like HTML, CSS is just as open. Anyone can use it for free, and that's also crucial to its success, I think. So, I'm sure many of you have been through these uh, late nights, maybe long days, where you've you know, written CSS code. I'm not going to try and go through all of this, but show you just a few samples. This is where we started. You know, font size was kind of the first. The code is up here. You set it to be 40 pixels, and then you change the font size of the text. And then you can set the font style to be italic, 
and, and it, it gives it this slanted appearance. This is all very fundamental, and we can go through the code here and set the background color, which was you know, incredible in 1996, you know, when CSS1 came out, setting the border of the, the, around the element, that was really, really hot. And you know, when he came to set the color of the border and the style of the border, this was, wow, can you do that? Yeah, this is good. Text Shadow came in. Text Shadow was very early, um, maybe a little too early. It's actually quite an advanced property, and you can see that I'm using a browser here. I can actually select the text in this, in this screen. So this is, this is not an image. This is text behind there, and that's important because the, the search engines need the text. We don't really want to send you know, GIFs or pings around with text and you know Adobe has sold a lot of Photoshop uh, uh, copies due to people wanting to make text shadows of, uh, of, 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 of text but that's not necessary anymore you don't need that and you shouldn't do that you should use CSS instead and these days people I think have gotten the message um, a lot of you know every web page there is basically uses this here we switch to we come to CSS3 uh, and border radius. I was, I was actually against border radius for a long time. Uh, I said we have better things to do than border radius. You know, um, borders, you know, rounded borders, that's, that's so 70s, you know? <laughs> really, haven't we come past that? Do we need to do this? Um, but apparently, you know, a lot of people want to do rounded borders. <laughs> so I kind of given up on that fight. <laughs> I accept it. And it's actually pretty good, I've, I've discovered. One thing is to set border radius uh, to be 40 pixels in each of the corners. But by just changing a little line at the top here, you can make a totally different presentation. For the human eye, this looks very different. Um, and then you can set the border to be in only some of the corners, not all of them. Again, this is a one-liner, and you will learn that, that example in about 30 seconds if you sat down and, and, and read it. And this is, you know, the difference between these two, it's just visual fluff. Google will not index this document any differently, but for the human eye, it's very important for us that we can make these these changes. For the designers, they have this in their toolbox. They can make the page appearance very different, which is part of their job. And it's part of their job to make it compelling, to make it look good, and to give it a visual identity. And that's, that's what CSS gives them. It gives them a toolbox to do. I say them. It's probably you. you many probably of you are, are using or writing CSS. Many of you are probably writing CSS without knowing it. You're using some kind of framework that has you know, style sheets in it, uh, that's good. Um, but you can probably, I, I, I encourage you to, to go beyond this and, and, and look at the, um, uh, at the code beneath there. Uh, it's very simple to do, actually. This is a three-liner. And, you know, if I told you to change the rotation of this, this state symbol of Norway um, and, and make it rotate the other way around, you would, you would all probably do this within 30, 30 seconds. It's very simple. That's, that's part of why it's successful. Web fonts have also become part of CSS. For a while, we had these 10 fonts that Microsoft donated. They were great. They worked from you know, mid-90s till 2005. That was basically all we had. Um, but then we said, you know, we want more fonts. Fonts is such a basic basic uh, unit of typography. We want to have more fonts. So we added web fonts where you can just point to a URL and, you know, this again, visual fluff, but it changes the perception of these documents. And it also makes it possible to support languages that have no native support in the operating system. For example, in India, there's a lot of languages that don't have the privilege of having you know, fonts ship with the operating systems. You need to add that later. And by doing so, through web fonts, you can actually support Wikipedia in languages that would otherwise not, not uh, work. So it warms my heart to see this technology being used to push Wikipedia further. Um, 
few words about testing, because a specification, you can write a specification, there's tons of specifications, and unless you test it to make sure that it really, really works, nobody's ever going to use it. And this is, we probably spent 10 times as much work testing specifications than writing it. And here's a screenshot from some years ago showing how different browsers um, rendered the rounded borders thing. And there were problems there. Uh, the standards group couldn't do all of that work. We had to have help from the community. And fortunately, a very strong community formed around CSS. The web standards projects has been crucial. Also, we've written tests along the way. This test was um, announced when Microsoft said they would do a version of the, the, the browsers, when they said they would do IE7. IE6 had been there for years. It was kind of an ice age. It changed very slowly, and it had all these bugs that made it impossible to write uh, HTML and CSS that was advanced and, 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 and interoperable. So we put out a challenge to Microsoft and to all the other browsers too, including Opera actually, where we said, you know, this is a very difficult page. Uh, when it, 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 it's correct, this should look like this. And behind every pixel on this, in this seemingly simple figure, there's a difficult test. So when the ACID 2 test came out, this is, <laughs> this is what it, it rendered in, in, in IE6. And it's pretty nasty, you know? It's pretty bloody. You can kind of see there's two eyes up there. Uh, the nose is gone. Um, there is a mouth, and there's something dripping from the mouth here. <laughs> so we threw it out and said, you know, try fix this, Microsoft. And when IE7 came out, this is what it looked like, you know. <laughs> it's possibly even worse. <laughs> it's harder to see the eyes this time. They are up here, though. There's a scroll bar there. I'm not sure what that means. The mouth is there, and the dripping is, you know, <laughs> more of it. <laughs> so we thought, you know, we had to give up on this. Are they never going to change? But then something incredible happened, because people started to, in conferences like this, people started raising their hands when Microsoft were on stage and said, when are you going to fix ACID 2? You know, they had a lot of people pounding on them, saying, when are you going to support standards? And then when IE8 came out, the magical thing happens. It was perfect, incredible. A community had, had actually forced Microsoft to change path and to make their browser compatible with the rest so that you can now write, pretty much write any HTML and CSS and it will work in any browser. That's an, that's an incredible thing. I'm gonna say a little bit about Opera as well. Um, Opera Mini was just, um, a product that has made the web reach people that would otherwise not have it. What we did in Opera Mini, many of you maybe still have it in your pockets, it's to uh, compress data. Because mobile connections are slow, they used to be even slower, uh, but they're also expensive and you have limited amounts of data. So we compress data in the fixed network before we send the, the page over to the to the browser, a mini browser that's running in the, in the phone. And that makes it possible for me. I, last uh, fall, I was in Russia, and I could brag that we had saved Russian users from downloading uh, 26,000 terabytes of data in Russia just one year. Incredible amounts of data we can save. Uh, we make it faster, we make it cheaper for people to use the web. And when we developed this around 2005, we had this, um, well, this is actually a little bit later, these stories came out, but we had this, these, these um, articles come out in Chicago. Chicago had a very advanced uh, bus network at the time. Uh, they had GPS receivers in the buses and they sent data to the uh, a server so you could see where the buses are. Now, we find this all over, but this was in 2005, this was very early. And some of the journalists got hold of the, the access logs for, from this service, and they found that most of the users of this real-time um, data service were actually coming from Norway. And you know why would that be? They speculated, um, and, and one of the journalists wrote, um, Norwegians are either utterly fascinated with the comings and goings of CTA buses 
or there just aren't enough recreational activities in the land of fjord and Viking ships. <laughs> Which is actually pretty funny. <laughs> but I can assure you, we have enough to do in Norway. We don't have to watch the, the buses in Chicago. And you're so smart, you probably figured out what happened here already. Um, this was not Norwegians looking at the buses in Chicago. This was people standing in Chicago, probably freezing, waiting for the bus, and they pick up their phones, and they have Opera Mini running on it. And because at the time, we had all the Opera Mini servers in our basement in Oslo, all the traffic went through Oslo. So it seemed, from the logs, it seemed that all the traffic was coming out of Norway, but it, 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 it wasn't actually. So internet changes how you look about, how you look upon geography, where you are isn't necessarily so clear anymore. And um, we saw another great example of Opera Mini uh, some years ago during the uh, revolution in Egypt. This is a more serious topic. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about politics or revolutions, really, but I will show you what we could see from our data logs, because we had all these uh, servers and the traffic, the Opera Mini traffic went through our service. So we could see that in Egypt, before the revolution, there was you know, usage of Opera Mini, a little bit up and down, not so much, but, but we had users. And then suddenly, there's a spike in the usage. Things go up, and we see that we think, you know, people don't trust TV or radio anymore. Uh, they take to their pockets, and what they find, they find Opera Mini. And then the government realizes that people get news from outside, through Opera Mini, probably, so they turn off the whole internet, and the thing goes dead for three days. And then it magically came back on again, maybe because governments realize that people get angry when, when they don't get access to the internet. So it comes on again, and, and, and people you know, turn on their, their phones. And maybe the most interesting thing here is that this thing has now leveled at a much higher point. So that when people get used to this thing, they will continue to use it. When they're in a difficult situation, what they do first is pick up their phones. It's become an incredible part, a very important part of our daily lives to use, to use the web. So we, as technologists, I think, have an obligation then to make sure that this thing goes in the right direction, that they do get access to, to news and contacts, and that things work well, and that they, 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 people find what they what they are looking for, and also that they can get access to the web wherever they are. And I was on an incredible journey um, a year ago where you may have heard of the Kontiki expedition, 1947. Thor Heyerdahl sailed a, a raft from Lima in Peru into Polynesia. Some of us wanted to see if it was possible to do this not only into Polynesia, to Easter Island, but also going back again. So we built we built another raft, um, and in order to tell about this, we had internet actually on the raft, and I was the technical guy there. I was responsible for, you can see the antenna here at the back. This is now, it's, it's, it's much easier, of course, these days to, to, to be in contact. We have satellites, 600 kilometers over us. There's satellites, and we can connect to them, and we can actually then, we can actually tell what's going on on the raft. Here's, we sent this thing down to, to measure the, the um, temperature of the water um, down, um, and we got it all the way down to 2,046 meters. We had a very long rope. So we could tell this in real time, that we have now been able to measure the temperature of the water. Scientists need to know this, because the, the Earth is getting warmer, and they can actually measure the temperature of the water on the surface level from the satellite, but they can't look down. And by sending this thing down, we actually helped improve the data points that they have for this. So that was fun. Uh, Opera actually sponsored uh, this expedition a little, so we could do T-shirts and stuff. But you know, T-shirts, what is that? Here is more product placement. Opera Max is one of our products. <laughs> but you know, some people said, Hokun, that's really false advertising. You have to do 
Opera Mini! <laughs> and Opera Mini was actually very helpful for us because satellites are very expensive to use. And if you could do compression, that helps you, helps you a lot. So, but we were able to be connected even in the most remote part of the planet in the Pacific. I only have a few seconds left. I'd like to give you a challenge before I leave. I'd like to tell you, I'd like to challenge you to make a book. Because CSS and HTML can be used for screens, we know that. Um, but it can also be used for printing. And this was actually part of the initial proposal was to say that um, we have the potential of supporting many output media, for example, paper, speech, and braille. This was in this initial CSS proposal from 2000 and um, from 90, sorry, from 1994. And I've been trying to do this after that, uh, together with Bert Boss, co-creator of CSS, we wrote a book. And we, for the third edition of this, the first and second we did in FrameMaker, a desktop publishing package. Third edition, we say, we want to use HTML and CSS for our book. If, if, if we're going to show that this thing works, we should you know, eat our own dog food, kind of. And after that, Lara, uh, Leah uh, has also written a book about CSS uh, in CSS. So that's a good thing. It is being used, but it hasn't changed the world as much as the web has on our screens. So I'd like to challenge you to try format a book using HTML and CSS. And a book has a few different things. It has page numbers and such. I have to be very quick here. It's blinking on me. But the CSS code is very much the same. Uh, it's simple statements. Here we set the size of the, 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 the output page, and we set the margins. And we say that in the bottom right corner, there should be a page number. Very, very simple. And there are formatters out there. You can't use a browser. Browsers aren't, aren't good enough for this. But you can use Prince, for example, or Antenna House to format a, a, an HTML document into a PDF document, which you can send to the printer. It's also a great way of studying typography. Uh, for this book I did, this is a book written by Henry Gibson. You know, you don't have to write the book yourself. You can find somebody else's book, something that's out of copyright. I found this first edition, and I noticed this G here. It's a very tiny little hook on the G. And I wondered, which font is this? It's not commonly used today. But I was able to track it down in the Museum of Typography in Lyon in France. There I found a font family called Elsevier. And as you can see, here is my G with the little hook on it. So I learned a lot about typography uh, from that. Last point, looking back, also tells us something about the future, I think. How long will this thing last? How long is the web going to be around? I think that the web is going to be around for a long time. And that's based on the fact that this invention, the printing press, was done by Johannes Gutenberg 500 years ago. And we still have it today. We still have books today. We still know how to use books. The thing that he created, if we had one of his books here, we could still use it. This is one of his Bibles that is printed. And it's still one of the most beautiful books ever done. And we would still know how to use it if we had one copy here. So I think the web is going to be with us 500 years. That's basically the time since Gutenberg did his invention. And after that, we've had in other inventions, we've had TV and radio. I don't think those measures up with the web. The web is really changing the world like the printing press did. But unlike the printing press, the web is changing the whole world, not just Europe and the West like the printing press did. So this is a worldwide thing. We had to take good care of it. We had to protect it. We had to write good standards. We had to write good code. We had to make information accessible to everyone. And then I think the code you write today will be readable 500 years from now. So make sure it's good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Applause from thousands of people feels pretty good, actually.